afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second uh, Wynn Distinguished Lecture in 2013. And it's a real pleasure to introduce Professor Bill Milne, who is the head of electrical engineering at Cambridge University. He's also the director of the Center for Advanced Photonics and Electronics and head of Electronic Devices and Materials School. Professor Milne, as you'll hear in a few minutes, is a Scotsman and he did his Never BS, BSc at St. Andrews University and graduated mm -hmm. from Imperial College London with a PhD in electronic materials in 1973. After his PhD, he worked at Plessy Research in Caswell then joined Cambridge as an assistant lecturer. He then set up the Electronic Devices and Materials Group, which now has six staff members, 30 postdocs, and over 50 students with an annual income of about 10 million euros. Dr. Mellon has had a distinguished career in electronic devices and materials. He was elected the Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in 2006 and was awarded the J.J. Thompson Medal from the EIT, that's the Institute of Engineering and Technology, in 2008 for achievements in electronics. He has been a guest professor in many universities, <laughs> for example at Hangzhou University in Wuhan, China, and a uh, visiting professor at Southeastern University in Nanjing and at the National University of Singapore, uh, uh, also as a distinguished uh, professor. He's also been very involved with the Korean go government and Ki Hung Hee University in Seoul. And of course, in 2003, he received a uh, Doctor of Engineering honoris causa from the University of Waterloo. His research interests are in large area silicon and carbon-based electronics, as well as MEMS, carbon nanotubes, and graphene. This is the topic he's going to talk about this afternoon. Professor Milne has spun off several companies from Cambridge and has collaborated with Samsung, with some very large companies, Samsung, Thales, Nokia, Extron, and FEI. He's published or presented uh, 650 papers, 150 of which have been keynotes or invited uh, addresses. So please, Give a warm welcome to Bill Mill. Thanks, Arthur. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, okay, today's talk, I'm going to try and speak about some of the stuff we've been doing for the last uh, 15 or so years on carbon nanotubes. As many of you will, uh, I presume, remember, carbon nanotubes is going to be the next wonder material. And recently, that's been perhaps overtaken by the fact that graphene is going to be the next one of materials. So maybe I can come back here in 15 years' time and give a very, very similar talk on graphene. But maybe not. We'll find out. Anyway, what I'm going to try and do is give a very brief introduction to uh, Cambridge, where we are uh, in Cambridge, and then how we grow them with um, carbon nanotubes, how we optimize the growth for particular applications, and then look at some of the applications in detail. Like all these things, the first thing you should do is actually acknowledge all the help you've had from the various people throughout uh, the work that's been carried out. So I'd just like to say thanks to all these guys on the left. If I could get this thing to work. Oh, there we go. I'll go back the round over. Uh, Ken Teo and Gahan Amaratunga and all these guys down here did a lot of work with me originally. We've worked a lot with various different companies, as, as Arthur uh, mentioned, and we get an awful lot of money from Europe. It would be very difficult to do a lot of this work without the help we've had, mostly from the European Commission, sometimes from our own government, EPSRC, and sometimes from industry. Okay, this is a breakdown of what I'm going to say. Brief introduction, growth, optimization, applications, some sort of conclusion. So I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about Cambridge, uh, sort of vaguely old. Um, we had our 800th anniversary about four years ago, and as my friends all say, it's taken us 800 years to get it wrong, but I suppose we're maybe improving. The university started in 2009, but it was an offshoot of Oxford. Oxford's slightly older than Cambridge, and one guy from Oxford decided he didn't like Oxford, he wanted to go somewhere else, and he, he started Cambridge <coughs> in 2009. The, um, of course, Newton and guys like that, up until about 19, 1875, when one of the most important things happened, and that was when the engineering department started in Cambridge. And as you can see, he also was a Scotsman, James Stewart, 
We're full of Scotsmen in Cambridge, obviously. So it's about 804 years old. Um, many of you have seen these pictures, like some of you know that I've been there. Uh, people always view this as being the university, which is slightly confusing because it isn't. These are the colleges. We have 31 independent colleges, each self-financed, separate endowment. Every student goes to one of these colleges, and then they're sent by the college to go to the university. The university itself consists of six schools, arts and humanities, social sciences, humanities, and so on, and the most important one, uh, technology, which is where we are. But this is uh, sort of King's College. You've seen it before, I guess, and this is, uh, I think, the Bridge of Size and St. John's College. As I said, all the students go there. They're just like upmarket halls of residence, okay? But the university are the schools. Uh, we have about 18,500 students, which is not huge compared to some of the universities in, in Canada and America, with about uh, 6,500 postgrads and about 12,000 um, PhD and master's students. As I said, the, the university itself doesn't consist of these colleges, it actually consists of schools. And we have these six schools. We are part of the School of Technology. The School of Technology consists of five departments, engineering, chemical engineering, computers, Institute of Biotechnology, and for some reason the Judge Business School it comes under technology as well, but this is a, a historical thing. The same historical reasons, I guess, that chemical engineering is separate to engineering, and engineering itself is a unified engineering department that covers most aspects of engineering, apart from chemical. It includes electrical. So we have one department of engineering with six divisions, as opposed to what you normally have as one faculty in six departments. And we are the electrical division. As I say, the department's about 125 years old. We are, by quite a long way, the biggest department in the university. It's about 10 to 11 percent of the university, depending on your metric. Uh, number of people, number of staff, income, etc. It's around about 10, 11 percent of the whole university. We have about 1,500 students and we're ranked first in the UK and many other places. Uh, this is the old bit of the department where we used to be and where the main part of the engineering department is and about seven years ago we moved out. But as I said, we have six divisions, electrical fluids, mechanics, civil, manufacturing management, and information and electrical. We used to be electrical and information engineering, we got too big and so they split this up and now all we are is electrical. And we moved out about seven years ago to this new building uh, which looks a little bit more modern than the other stuff you've seen recently. So what I'm going to speak about is the work that we've carried out uh, mostly in this uh, building which houses electrical engineering and, and as Arthur mentioned also the Center for Advanced Photonics and Electronics. It's often called the Cape Building because it's a lot shorter than saying it's the electrical engineering building of the engineering department of Cambridge University. Cape is a lot shorter, so that's, people call it Cape. And just in passing, I just thought I'd just like to mention, we really, Cambridge is often seen as being this ivory tower type place, and you know, it's not quite true. We actually work very, very closely with industry. And this is just a selection of the industries that we actually work with in the, the electrical engineering and, and engineering department in general. So we actually cover a huge breadth of different types of industry with the BBC, we work with Disney, we work with the Jaguar Land Rover, Cisco, Nokia, and so on. We, we do work with a lot of the major companies uh, throughout the world. Anyway, that's Cambridge. So now I'll speak about what I'm supposed to be speaking about, which is carbon nanotubes. Hopefully, some of you know what nanotubes are, just in case you don't. Essentially, carbon nanotubes are graphene sheet rolled up to produce a cylinder non-satisfied bonds. It looks a bit like a cigarette without the tobacco, so perhaps less damaging, but that's still to be seen. Um, <laughs> when you roll them up like this, depending on the direction you roll them, they can be semiconducting, but in some instances they can also be metallic-like. So it just depends on the, 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 what we call the chirality or bonding structure, whether the nanotube acts as a semiconductor or a metal or semi-metal. And as I say, depending on the angle you roll, it could be rolled in this way or this way or this way, you end up with 
two thirds of them semiconducting and one third of them metallic. That's what you get if you don't try and be clever and do something to the growth process to try and change that. If you just grow them in a normal way, you get two thirds semiconducting, one third metallic. And the bonding, the kind of bonding configurations you can get are zigzag, where the bond goes zigzag, zigzag, zigzag. The chiral, where the bond goes round and round and round, round and round and round. Or you get the armchair, where it goes like that. It looks as though you've got an armchair. Difficult to see, but take my word for it, that's what it looks like. And depending on the density of state you get within these different structures, you'll get different uh, electrical properties. So this just summarizes what I want you to really know about the properties before we go on any further. Rolled up graphene sheets, no unsatisfied surface bonds. They can be single walled, as I've just spoken about, but they can also be multi walled. Here's some examples here where you've got maybe four or five of them. Here's two, here's nine or ten. They're a bit like Russian dolls. They're all concentric. So you've got cylinders, each one of them, exactly the same center, slightly different <coughs> diameter. And you build up the single-walled ones, and you can get these multi-walled. They can be metallic or semiconducting, and the band gap of single-walled nanotubes uh, is dependent on the chirality, but it's also dependent on the diameter. So if you look at a nanotube, and you go down in diameter from 3 nanometers down to 1 nanometer, the band gap goes up from about 0.4 to 1.1. Generally speaking, multi-walled nanotubes are always metallic-like, and that just goes back to that figure, which says that once you've got three walls, one of them's going to be metallic, and that'll dominate. So once you've got above three walls, generally speaking, the tubes are metallic-like. Everybody happy with that? So single wall, multi wall they can be metallic, they can be semiconducting, uh, but the multi wall ones tend to be uh, metallic-like. The band gap of the single wall depends on the diameter as well as the chirality of bonding. So why were people so keen on CNTs? Uh, more or less the same reasons they're keen on graphene now. Very high conductivity, 10 to the minus 6. Very high thermal conductivity, so it can be used for thermal bonding, heat sinking. High mechanical strength, there's been lots of pretty pictures of uh, nanotubes being used to tether satellites, etc. Um, very few dangling bonds, it's pretty inert. It's covalently bonded which is very good if you want to drive very high currents through it. Um, it's, it, it, it leads to very, very low electromigration problems. A high surface to bulk ratio, as you can see, and so it's potentially very good for, for sensors. And that's the good stuff. The bad stuff is that how do you control the chirality and the diameter of the nanotubes? That's the first one. The second one is how do you control the position? And that's absolutely vital for most applications. But for logic -y type applications and many other things, you have to be able to control the chirality and diameter of the nanotubes so that each one has the same uh, band gap, and therefore you can use them for some particular applications. I'll go through these in turn now as we go along. So how do you produce nanotubes? Well, there are lots of different ways to do it. Um, to start with, Electric arc discharge and laser ablation were, were pretty, pretty favored. And basically, the reason is simple. Arc discharge is you take a couple of graphite uh, electrodes in a vacuum, you put a discharge between them, you eat away the graphite, and you produce soot, nano onions, rubbish, and nanotubes. And then you do a filtering process, you end up with some really quite good quality uh, nanotubes. Laser ablation is something similar. You have a carbon target. You hit it with a laser. If you get the correct conditions, you can get a mixture of soot and nanotubes, etc. Once again, you can then purify it and filter out the nanotubes. The way we choose to do it, and the way most other people did in the end, was to look at catalytic chemical vapor deposition, which is based on um, heating up carbon-containing gases and decomposing them into the nanotubes, as we'll go into in a second. So here's a, a, a cartoon of a typical growth process. So you can, you can use a few different catalysts, but it's catal it is catalytically driven. So you need something like a nickel catalyst or cobalt or molybdenum, something like that. 
that will help drive the, the growth. So you start with the substrate. You might put a barrier layer in here, but whatever else, you put the nickel catalyst. You then heat up the nickel catalyst in the deposition chamber at about in between uh, typically 500 to about 1,000 degrees C. And the nickel catalyst breaks up into little balls. You get these little balls on the surface. From being a thin film, you now get the nickel balls. You then strike the plasma, add the hydrogen containing, the carbon containing gas, which could be C2H2 or CH4 or whatever, and some etching gas, ammonia or hydrogen typically, and that etches away any unwanted amorphous carbon, and the carbon itself is there to make the carbon nanotubes. It's, in, in essence, quite simple. Uh, in practice, it's not so simple. So, substrate, heat up a heat up a thin film. Thin film produces little balls of catalyst. That catalyst can then be used to produce nanotubes. Here's an example of the nickel after it's been heated. You can see you get these little balls produced, and the balls vary a little bit in size because you're not controlling what size these nickel thin films will actually end up being. So you get a, quite a distribution of these uh, nickel dots. But the nickel dots then lead to the growth of the carbon nanotubes as shown here. So you can see what we've got is a bunch of carbon nanotubes growing upwards from the substrate as shown here. And the nickel, as you can see from the little white dot, is at the top. So this is what's called a top-down process where the nickel the, ca the nickel catalyst grows up the way, and it, down below it, the nan nanotubes grow, pushing the nickel up from the substrate. These are multi-wall nanotubes. You can see we can now grow them in a particular direction. So that's one thing we said we wanted to do. We want to be able to control the direction in which they grow. So you can do this by putting them in a plasma-enhanced chemical vapor deposition system. Essentially, you have two parallel plates. You have a substrate and a bottom plate. You apply a plasma, and within that plasma you get a sheath field produced, and the nanotubes line up in the direction of the sheath field. So here we go, a bunch of nanotubes lined up, but hopefully you can see that there's quite a variation in the height in these nanotubes, and if you look closely, you'll see the variation in the diameter as well. And that's purely because they start off from this different distribution of nickel balls uh, in terms of diameter and size. If you use CVD without a plasma, you can also grow them. But in that case, what you get is something like spaghetti because there's no way the, 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 to, to try and get the tubes to line up. There's no field. You end up with spaghetti. If you apply a small field, then you get a little bit of lining up. Above about 0.2 volts per micron, we found you get the tubes lined up. So the influence of plasma voltage on the alignment of the nanotubes. So we've got one way now to control the direction of growth of the carbon nanotubes. And just to give you some in situ, we did some, one of my colleagues, Stefan Hoffman, did some in situ growth studies of carbon nanotubes. And what he did here um, was to look at a nickel dot, this is a nickel catalyst, on an SiO2 substrate on silicon. So it's silicon, SiO2, and then nickel, and just see what happens, hopefully, if the movie works. Yep. So what you'll see is when the nickel dot's this big, the carbon starts coming in here, it starts going down the side, pushes down the side, and eventually you'll see it pushes the nickel catalyst off the substrate, and that gives you an example of a top-down growth process. Plonk. Okay? So you think, okay, if you have a piece of nickel, you put it on top of SiO2, uh, on top of SI, then you get a top-down growth process. We've said it's difficult to control the chirality and the growth, etc. Maybe, at least by doing this, we found that by using nickel and SiO2, it grows this way. I wish that were so. If, however, you do the same again. So here's another example. It's, in this case, we've got a much smaller ball, only one nanometer of nickel on SiO2. And you might think, look at this one here. Exactly the same process, add some carbon containing gas, what happens to the growth? You would think the nickel would come up and the tube would grow down, but it doesn't. You end up with the nickel staying where it is, 
and the nanotube growing up. And this highlights the problem we've got with carbon nanotubes in the control. It's very difficult to actually control the diameter and the actual type of nanotube you grow. Even when you, you start playing with the catalyst and the growth process, it's still very difficult to see exactly what's going on. In this case, we think it's something to do with the fact that if you have a lot of carbon coming in, which you get when you have a, a wide-based nickel, there's enough carbon comes in below here to push this off. Uh, in this case, there isn't enough, and so the, the nickel stays at the, the bottom and the tube grows up. It's the same when you use iron as the catalyst or cobalt. It's very difficult to actually control the growth precisely so you get exactly the same type of nanotube every time you grow. That's one of the big problems with carbon nanotubes. But there's been a lot of um, effort over the past few years in, on controlling, as I say, position and direction in which they grow. Here's one way, another way you can do them. Instead of applying a field, you can control the glass flow. And by in controlling the gas flow, you can end up with like, like a tartan pattern. Change the gas flow, you change the direction in which they grow. You can get graphoepitaxy, get little um, ledges where they can grow on preferentially. You can apply a field between two contacts, and then the nanotubes will grow in that direction. Exactly the same as the way when you get a field growing in the, the sheath field. So you've got a way now of actually controlling the direction the nanotubes grow, even though we still can't control the chirality and the actual diameter exactly every time we grow them. For some applications, we also want to be able to accurately control their, their size if we can. And when you're doing single wall nanotubes, that's very difficult. But if you grow multi wall, then it's, it's a bit easier. In this case, what we do is instead of having a thin film of nickel, we actually put down nickel dots, each nickel dot being accurately placed and having the same size by using e-beam lithography or nano imprint or some other technique like that. Then you grow the nanotubes from exactly the same size of nickel and the size of the nickel dot tells you what the diameter of the nanotube is going to be and the temperature and the time gives you the height. So we can now control uh, at least the height, the diameter and uh, the position by accurate control and placement of these nickel dots. But that's for multi-wall tubes. If you try and do this for single-wall tubes, by the way, which we've tried, what happens is they all fall over. Because the single-wall tubes are about one or two nanometers, they don't self, they just fall down. The only way you can get them to grow up that way is to have them back close together. So it's not, it's, it, it solves one problem, but not other ones. So anyway, we can now accurately control the height and the diameter and the position. And you can see this is the sigma. It's about 4.1% for the tip diameter and about 6.3% for the uh, height. For some other applications, we want to be able to control electron emission from the tip of the nanotube. So we put a bias up here, drag out electrons. And so what we want to do is to actually have a, a gate to control this. So it's, 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 we've used exactly the same kind of procedures as you use in self-aligned process in CMOS. You have here an individual single nanotube in a polysilicon gate. That's not easy to do, but you can do it if you have enough PhDs and enough time. <laughs> OK, I think that's all I want to say about what nanotubes are, how we grow them, and the kind of uh, properties they have. What I want to do now is go through some of the applications that we've worked on and and miss out the ones that we haven't, basically. So there are things like biogas, chemical sensors, solar cells, energy storage devices, supercapacitors, batteries that carbon nanotubes have been used in, but I haven't done that. So we've looked at transistors logic, field emission, their applications to replace copper in CMOS, transparent conductors to replace indium tin oxide, MEMS and NEMS, and in, in liquid crystals. So I'll go over some of these things. So, a few years ago, nanotubes were seen as being the obvious next step after silicon. They were going to replace silicon and so on. They're going to be much faster and better. The problem is, of course, as I said, is how do you produce nanotubes over a 12-inch wafer with the same reproducibility as you get for silicon? And it's very difficult. It's not impossible to make good quality transistors, but you really have to try quite hard. So here, 
What you do is you start off with a bottom gate transistor, which is like using silicon as the, the back gate, highly doped silicon. You put down SiO2. Then you put down some catalyst, usually with a barrier layer of Al203, and you grow a nanotube between them. Now, that seems, in cartoon form, quite easy. Um, unfortunately, when you get around to doing it, it's not that easy, because you generally find that when you do that, you get a characteristic which looks like a P-type transistor. It's got a reasonably high on current, but it's got a very high off current. And that's the big problem, because when you try and do something like that, what you tend to get is this. When you put two contacts down, you tend to get lots and lots and lots of single wall nanotubes growing between the contacts, not just one of them. And if you've got more than two nanotubes, then the chances are one of them is going to be a metal. And if it's a metal type, then the off current is going to be, by definition, pretty high. So IBM were very, very clever in what they did is they assumed they had a bunch of semiconducting and metallic nanotubes between the two contacts. So they bias the back gate to switch off all the semiconducting nanotubes. And then they passed the high current through it, and it just blew up the metal ones. It was just like a fuse. And so you can see in this case, there was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 metallic nanotubes. They just blown them all up. And after that, you're only left, if you're very lucky, with one nanotube. And then you get a reasonably good I-off to I-on ratio. So as I said, it needs a lot, of, a lot of PhD students and a lot of patience and time to do that. Uh, until someone can come up with a better way of doing it, this is not really a practical way to make a bunch of uh, uh, transistors. You can also do top gate, exactly the same principle. You put a bottom gate, a bottom substrate. Catalyst, grow the nanotube, source and drain, put on the top gate, high K dielectric for instance, and you've got a, a top gate transistor. You can make side gate transistors as well. It's, it's, um, it's all feasible, and here's some stuff we've done. So this is your bottom gate, your side gate, where you've got the, oh, that's a side gate, sorry, and a, a top gate. They all work, and they give you reasonably good tra transistor characteristics, but it really takes a lot of time and effort to do that. You can do that, and many other people have done it as well. This is some, some what the Javi did a few years ago, which is looking at in shift, um, shift registers and inverters. And over the past N years, people have done more and more of this. So you can now do ambipolar devices, ballistic field effect transistors, you can use high K, you get high current transistors by having lots of CNTs in parallel. Lots of simple logic has been done. And nowadays, people get up to, by controlling the growth better, maybe up to 90 or even 99% of the tubes will be semiconducting, which makes it a lot easier to make transistors. But you've got to remember that even though they're semiconducting, they're not all the same chirality, they're not all the same diameter, so you're still going to get a variation in the ion to I off. So that's... If you guys want to do something in the next 10 years, that's something that still has to be done. Hasn't happened in 15 years, so maybe not the next 10 either, but it gives you something to do. So it's going to be very difficult to do that. But I, I personally think one of the, the sort of low-hanging fruit, if you want, for um, nanotubes is something slightly different, which is actually to look at plastic electronics. Most people, when they speak about plastic electronics, think about organics and other things like that that you can put down in plastic. There's no reason whatsoever why you can't do, put down carbon nanotubes in plastic. You grow them, then you make an ink or a solution, and you spray them or you inkjet them, and you can put nanotubes in plastic quite easily. And we tried this a few years ago, and we got pretty rubbish results. But it's quite interesting as time goes on how people improve these things. And there's a company called Kanatu in Finland who last year produced these results, which shows the on-off ratio for a bunch of transistors on plastic with their mobility. And this is carbon nanotube, and you can see this study, he's got mobilities of the order of 20, 30, 40 for carbon nanotubes on plastic. Now, there's not many other things when you put them in plastic will give you mobility as high as that. So there's a big effort just now in trying to get plastic electronics to work. They've used organics, they're very low mobility, amorphous silicon, but it now looks as though I think there's some potential interest for nanotubes to work in plastic. I think the same about graphene, by the way. I think graphene 
on plastic will also be a, an interesting way forward. And this, this company has now made a whole bunch of different shift registers, logic gates, and so on. I think this is really quite neat, neat work, and it's, it's maybe the way forward for nanotubes. So it's like having a, a nink of nanotubes, meshes, and what you'd have to do is to do it better would be to, to filter out all the metallic ones, which you can just about do, leave the semiconducting ones, and then you can use different techniques to produce all the circuitry on a, on a plastic uh, substrate. I think that's a, a, an interesting way forward. More feasible, or maybe I should have said easier, um, might be based on what's called field emission. Now, I don't know how many of you have done field emission, but just in case you haven't, we'll give you a, a two-minute tutorial on field emission. So, metals, semiconductors, they've got lots of electrons in them, as you know, but they don't fall on the floor. They're quite happy to stay in the semiconductor or the metal. And to get them out, there's two ways you can do it. You have this barrier at the surface which stops the electrons coming out. You can heat them up, thermionic, so you heat the thing up. Electrons can then be thermionically emitted out of the surface. But another way of doing it is instead of using temperature to give them an increase in energy, you actually apply high bias and get them to tunnel through the, the surface barrier. Field emission, that's called. By application of a high enough positive bias, you can drag electrons out through this barrier. It's a bit difficult if you have a flat surface and you put a high bias here, the lines just go like this, and you're really in a very high field to actually drag electrons out of just a typically flat surface. It's possible, but it does require very high fields. However, if you have something shaped like this, which you may note a carbon nanotube looks a bit like, you apply a bias, the, the field focuses on the top of the nanotube, and you get an enhanced field. So at any given field up here, you get an enhanced effective field on here, which leads to a much higher field, much more efficient tunneling through the electron. So due to this high aspect ratio, the CNT amplifies the applied electric <coughs> field to reduce the potential barrier and enable efficient quantum mechanical tunneling of electrons. That's field emission. So apply application of a bias to drag electrons out of a material. Why is that useful? Well, it's useful for lots of different things. One of them being just the standard electron emission source in electron microscopes. SEMs, TEMs, most of you have used them. And there's lots of many different techniques uh, to produce electrons for such uh, microscopes, thermionic emitters being one of them. But nanotubes might be a way to give you a more efficient electron emitter for electron microscopes. So what we tried to do was produce carbon nanotubes as electron emitters for a TEM and SEM. We did this in collaboration with Philips a few years ago. And how we started off by doing it was we started off by taking a, a typical field emitting source for a microscope, which is actually a tungsten tip. So normally, they would use a tungsten tip. And then you bias and the electrons would emit from here. But we thought, if you could put a carbon nanotube on top of the tungsten tip, then you get an enhancement of the enhancement, if you want. It's double. The, um, and the enhancement tends to be related to the, the diameter of the, the tip and the length of the tube. So, so we thought, OK, the first thing we'll do, start off with spaghetti-type nanotubes. You bring up a tungsten tip with a little bit of carbon glue on it. You stick it to a nanotube. And then a bit like the IBM guys did with the metal nanotubes, you high, apply a high voltage and you blow the thing up. And you end up with a nanotube attached to the tungsten tip, which we thought was very clever. The only problem is, when you do it n times, you find it maybe n minus 1 times, you get this. The nanotube actually isn't aligned with the direction of the, the uh, tip. Sorry. You know, ideally, you want this to be an extension of this here. And every time we did it, well, more, most times we did it, which makes it a bit difficult because if you not try to put this in an electron microscope and you're trying to get the electrons coming here to be focused to go up here, it's not the easiest thing in the world. So it was quite a neat idea, but then we decided a better idea would be to actually grow the things in situ. And so what we did is we found a new way of actually taking nanotubes, 
and growing them on top of an individual tungsten tip. Now how you do that is you, you have a, a PECVD system, and if any of you know about PECVD, if you've got something metal sticking up in the middle of a plasma, what happens is the plasma goes on and etches away, and you actually get the stuff etched rather than grown. So that doesn't sound too clever. But I had quite good PhD students at the time, and what they did was they took plasma, the bottom plasma plate, they bored a whole bunch of holes in them, and then they just stuck through the individual uh, tongues and tips, just right in the middle of each hole, and then when the field came down, it just lined up perfectly perpendicular to the substrate and also allowed the growth of the nanotubes perpendicular to the growth direction. Exactly the same as in uh, the stuff I showed you before. It's really quite neat. All the nanotubes down here don't really count because this one totally dominates. So it's uh, so we did this with FEI and with um, Philips. And uh, what we found was if you compare it with a typical tungsten thermionic emitter or a lantern hexaboride or shot key or tungsten, these are all the cold field. These are all the ones that are used nowadays for SEMs and TEMs. If you compare the properties, then what you get using CNT is you get a much higher brightness. This is a funny unit, amps per centimeter square per steradian, but it just means how bright is the signal. Nanotubes are much better than anyone else. The kinetic energy spread, you want as small an energy spread as possible coming out the source to make it more efficient, and that's pretty <coughs> good as well. The stability isn't as good as some of them, and the virtual source size is not as small as it could be either. And the reason for that is because these tubes are multi-wall. If we could make them single wall, it would give you a smaller source, but that's, that's very difficult to do. So it's pretty good for these things, not so good for that one, and that one almost good, but very close. And we, we've now got this down to 1.6, so this is okay, but that's still a problem. But it is an application for CNTs, which I think is, 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 is quite feasible. But there are lots of other field emission applications, and I'll just go through a couple of them. One was the idea of a flat panel display. Now, you're all familiar with flat panel displays now. We've all got laptops and these things, and they all work in basically the same way. The liquid crystal displays, you have a backlight, and then you have a liquid crystal display which acts as a shutter to let the light through or not through. That's how it works. It's very power hungry because the lights, the backlight's always on. And so there was a a feeling at the time, this was about 10 years ago, no more than that actually, that we better have some other way of producing a flat panel display which could give you higher contrast, less power, and so on. And one real potential applica uh, application for CNTs was to produce what we call a field emission display. And that's essentially a flat panel corollary of a CRT. So if you look at a carbon cathode ray tube, which most of you will remember, I suppose, it's getting increasingly that some of you won't remember what a cathode ray tube is, but anyway, a uh, cathode ray tube. So it works quite simply, as you can see, by you start off with an electron beam, it's got, you've got an evacuated tube, you've got a phosphor screen, the electron hits the phosphor screen, light comes out. Yeah. Now, that was very good. And if, 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 if you actually have a cathode ray tube, next to a flat panel, this kind of flat panel display, that looks much better. Everybody is asked always likes this display better. They like the, the color gamut that comes from it. And this stuff is a bit washed out. They're getting much better nowadays. And so the idea was to try and replace the cathode ray tube by a flat panel version. So the cathode ray tube works by having a, call this an electron beam. If you want a screen this size, you can't obviously do that because you can't, get that up there. So you do that and you scan like that. CRT is this deep. So what, you, what the suggestion was, instead of having one E-beam, you have lots of E-beams. And each one can locally scan the phosphor screen and you end up with a flat panel version of the CRT. So basically, the CRT was good, but it's heavy. You can't imagine it being a laptop. Very high voltage but it's got a great display. So if you could actually change it, instead of having one E-beam or the E-beams for the three colors, 
you have lots and lots of them. And so that was the, the reason for going for a field emission display. And high brightness, very wide viewing angle. I don't know if you remember the, the old versions of these things. When you got to about here, you got a ghost. And the picture sort of inverted. And um, the thing the FED does, you'd have no problems with that at all. You've got a very good viewing angle. And the idea was a high resolution, low power consumption, and it operates over a wide temperature range, which the liquid crystal doesn't. Um, you don't need very well aligned nanotubes to do this. You can just use nanotubes as the field emitters. You can put them in each individual pixel. And this was a picture of a 38 inch FED that we worked with, with Samsung. This is not the picture, this is a picture on my laptop, so I don't think it's, it's not too good because my laptop's bad. But it was a really good picture of a 38 inch full color FED display which looked fantastic. And the technology was transferred to uh, other parts of Samsung, but it hasn't come to the market. And, and basically it's not because it's not pretty, it's basically because of this. That over the past couple of years, it's been, the investment in LCDs has gone up and up and up, and you can now make 104-inch diagonal AM LCDs, just one panel, not tiled, just one single panel. And the investment now is something like $4.25 billion for a line to make these. And since they've invested all this money to do this, it's highly unlikely they're going to go and go back to FED. So FEDs might eventually have some sort of market, I don't know, in, in harsh environments, but I don't think they're going to come, come on stream now. It's a pity, because they're ever so pretty. The second thing is very similar to that. It uses the same sort of principle. If you've got a CRT and you have to do this to get the large uh, area, most of you, or many of you, will have used e-beam lithography. Yeah? You use e-beam lithography, it's the same idea. You have an electron beam. If you want to scan across a 12-inch wafer or a, even a 6-inch wafer, it takes an awful long time when you've got a nano beam scanning across 6 inches. It takes time. You get very high resolution, but it does take time to do it. So the idea here is to have a parallel e-beam lithography, exactly the same principle. Instead of having one e-beam, you have many e-beams. And an X by Y array. And locally, each e-beam will scan a part of the wafer identical to its next door neighbor. And so you've got parallel e-beam lithography with the same resolution as you get with e-beam lithography, but a much faster th throughput, because you've now got n of the beams working at the same time. I mean, ultimately, of course, it's going to make, need thousands of these by thousands, but our initial one with Talus was the 33 by 33 array. And that was part of a, a European proposal. So everybody happy with what we're trying to do here? So you have, if you want, X by Y array of individual CNTs, then they scan the wafer or the mask to produce locally each little bit. You can see now the problem with this is that if you've got one CNT here and another one away down here, how do you make sure that the electrons emitted from here are exactly the same as the ones emitted from here, because if you, you want to fully expose the wafer, they all have to have the same dose. And so we worked with the Fraunhofer guys in um, Hamburg, and they came up with a really clever, if somewhat complicated, a feedback signal. What you do is you dial the curtain and you say, I want N microamps, and every single individual CNT is driven by one of these things, and it controls the current perfectly. And then you can it's integrated in the silicon, so this is a silicon slice. This is the emitter, which sits here. This is the gate, which extracts the electrons, and this is the focus, to focus the electrons on the wafer or the mask. Now, this is one of the completed things, and I tried, well, my students tried. Even when you've got lots of students, this was impossible. There is a CNT in here, but it was impossible to actually break one of these things and get the CNT to still be there. What it is, is it looks like that, but it's also now got this extra focus gate. So it's all integrated in silicon. And it was implemented by Thales, and it, was, uh, it worked pretty well. And they're still trying to make it bigger. It's not impossible to make a 33 by 33, but to make a 1,000 by 1,000 is a bit more tricky. 
Okay, so they're reasonably complicated. This one is even more complicated, so I'll go reasonably slowly. So spaghetti types are okay for some applications. As I say, for field emission, they're actually okay. You don't need a very high current density field emitted. When they're very close to each other, however, what you find is they shield each other. So if, if you apply a bias here, the, the field will focus on this one, but all the ones down here, when you've got the spaghetti field, the field doesn't penetrate them. And so the only ones that emit are the high ones, the tall ones. And you tend to find that if spaghetti, only about one in 10 to the four, or maybe one in 10 to the five of the CNTs actually emit. So what we did is we, that's why we got this new technique for growing the CNTs, to make them all the same height and the same distance apart. If you make them about two times their height apart, then you'd get no field screening. And each one of these emits. And by doing that, you get more current emitted. And for some applications, that's what we need. So that's why we needed to design these arrays of CNTs. And what it's used for is this. Um, many of you won't be aware of traveling wave tubes, so I'll try and explain how they work. But all the satellites that bomb around up here generating their, their signal, they need some way of generating the signal. And what they do is they use these things called traveling wave tubes. And I'll come back to in a minute what that means. But each one of these satellites has a few of these. And basically, for every kilogram in weight you can save, you can save 40k euros. So it's worth trying to make these things smaller. Traveling wave tubes are the kind of things that we worked on as students. In fact, maybe even before I worked on as a student, but anyway, it's a long time old. But they're essentially vacuum tubes. Now, this is how they work. And it's, it's, reasonably, it's, a, it's a reasonably neat idea. Um, what you do is you start off with a, a bunch of emitters here. So it would be thermionic emitters, because this is what the old technology was. So you start off with a thermionic emitter here. Heat it up, the electrons come, come out. But because it's, you heat it up, you can't pulse it very fast. You want megahertz, gigahertz out of here. You can't get that by pulsing a thermionic emitter because it takes a long time for the thing to heat up, a long time to cool down. So when you bias the thermionic emitters, you get a DC beam. So it's a DC beam of electrons. Are we happy with that? Emitted thermionically. You then make them pass through this helix. And on this helix, you impose an RF signal. And so when one electron comes out, in one half of the RF signal, it will be accelerated. The next electron comes out, it will see the negative half of the AC signal, because the AC signal is going up, down, up, down, up, down. As the electro some electrons come out, they get accelerated. Some come out, they get decelerated. The accelerated ones catch up with the decelerated ones, and the slow ones catch up with the fast ones. And you end up with rarefactions, bunches, rarefactions, bunches, a bit like when cars come onto a motorway. And you end up with a modulated beam. So it requires a high temperature to get the thermionics emitted. It is high power, DC beam. And then the last thing before we go to the, 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 the CNT one, when you come through here, although much of the DC beam is converted to AC, and you then couple it out through an aerial, a lot of the DC beam isn't. And you need this big chunk of metal as a heat sink to get rid of the, ex the excess energy still within the beam that went through the helix. So you convert the DC beam to AC, but it's really quite inefficient. However, if you try and use a, a CNT, then the CNTs you can modulate directly. You don't have to have DC. So you can get cold emitter. It's no heating. It's pulsed. It can generate, generate short pulses and power and demand. You don't have to heat them up like thermionic. But once again, you have to put them through a helix just to make them a, a bit more um, well-defined. So the thing comes in here, use the helix again for the RF. Some of them slow it down, some are speeded up, slow it down, speed it up, slow it down, speed it up, and you end up with a bunched beam, AC beam. And you end up with a, a really neat, shorter, less power-hungry, you don't need all this uh, extra metal to, to gobble up the extra energy, and you get uh, a very good traveling wave tube. We did this with Talus. 
We published it a while ago. We can get 12 amps per centimeter squared at 1.5 gigahertz and about 1.4 amps per centimeter squared at 32 gigahertz. Just using carbon nanotubes rather than thermionic emitters, they work very effectively. Very narrow bandwidth, we have to uh, increase that, but there, there's work ongoing uh, in Thales doing that. So there, the things we worked on a while ago, what we're working on now is looking at X-ray sources, portable X-ray sources. So instead of using a standard big X-ray sources, you now use CNTs to generate the electrons to stimulate X-rays. In this case, um, it's, it's for portable mammo mammography and also for um, things like safety in airports. If you, know, if you leave your briefcase down an airport and forget it, the chance that you go back, they've blown it up. It would be really nice if you could actually have a, a portable x-ray system that could actually have a look and say, oh, there's nothing in there apart from your, your book and your clothes. So we've been doing that for the past uh, few years. And in this case, it's the same s similar thing as previously with individual nanotubes. In this case, they have to have uh, series resistors to limit the current coming out because of the high current densities. But this is really quite close to being very useful. So that's all I want to say about field emission. It's potentially really one of the easier, well, one of the more interesting applications for CNTs. <coughs> okay, the last five minutes or so. One of the other potential applications for CNTs is to replace copper. As densities and sizes of dev devices go smaller and smaller, we have to get a replacement for the copper via an interconnect. Um, so, you know, our CNT is good for that. Well, if you look at the current density of aluminium, it's about 10 to 5. For copper, it's 10 to 7. CNTs, in theory, have about 10 to 9 amps per centimeter squared. So, in theory, they should be much, much better than <laughs> copper for VS and interconnects. What you've got to note, however, is read the papers correctly. This 10 to 9 is if you actually grow nanotubes under the perfect condition for growing nanotubes. So it's maybe about 900 or 1,000 degrees C. If you try and do that in the back end of a logic or a memory device, you kill all the logic in the memory. So although in theory the CNT has a really good current density, at low temperatures it may not. But what people are trying to do is to grow these nanotubes inside these vias. Here's some examples. You can see hopefully the problem even if you could get two orders better conductivity, if you're only filling up two orders less of the volume, then you haven't gained very much. So you've got to find a way of actually growing the nanotubes very high packing density in these, in these vias. So these are the problems. It's a back-end process. So here's something else that you can do in the next couple of years. Uh, so you need to limit growth to about 400 or 600, depending on whether it's logic or memory. Need to, so you need to improve the quality of low temperature produced nanotubes. For instance, for a 2 micron via, the CNT resistance at present is about 0.6 ohms. That's about one order higher than copper. It's about the same order as tungsten. It's not very good. So if you're going to make these nanotubes in the holes, what do you use? Single wall metallic ones or multi wall? Obviously you don't want to use semiconducting ones because you want to use the ones with the highest conductivity. Which catalyst do you use? How do you deposit in the hole? How do you increase the packing density? How do you make these things? My system has failed. Yeah. Okay, basically what I'm saying is that in order for this to work as a, 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 a via, you need to increase the packing density. That, and that is a really big problem. And so what you're trying to do is to get them to look like, if you want, this, rather than that. And so we've been doing this for the past year and a half or so, and the idea is to try and get the nanotubes as close together. So they're essentially limited by how close you can get the catalysts together. And you might think it's simple. All you do is you put down some catalysts, easy, and then you put down another bunch of catalysts, and that gives you more and more bunch. But what happens if you put more catalysts on this catalyst, all that happens is these catalysts grow bigger. And so what our clever students did was what they did is they immobilized these ones by oxidizing them. Then you put down more catalyst. They don't then agglomerate. And then you reduce them. 
And so by doing that a, f a few times, we've actually managed to get up to the situation where we can now get a 10 to the 13 per centimeter square, which is exactly what you need for the, uh, the packing density in these holes. So we're getting close to the densities we require. The problem is that's on a flat surface. It's not in the hole. So the next trick is to how do you get the thing to go in the hole. So there's something else you can do in the next 10 years. It's, um, it's, it's, it's neat, but it's, it's, it needs more work. Where else are they going to be? Oh, transparent conducting films can forget that. The last thing I was going to speak about was MEMS. Um, in this instance, this is quite a neat idea. We have two nanotubes, vertical nanotubes, and you can use them as a switch. So volatile, non-volatile memory. By applying a bias, you can make the switch click onto there. By applying a bias, you can make it click off. If you change the length of the nanotubes, when you click it on, it stays on until you tell it to come off. If you change the length to uh, a smaller one, it'll just go click, click, click. So you get both the idea of it sticking or it just going there, back again, just by controlling the length of the nanotubes. It's really quite a neat idea. And the last one I was going to show you is the use of CNTs in electrically reconfigurable holograms. All of you have seen these holograms where you get, it looks like a piece of glass with a little rubbish on it, and you shine a light through it, and it looks like Mickey Mouse. And then you get another one, and you shine a light through that, and it looks like Donald Duck. It would be really good if you have the same hologram and shine a light through it, it looks like Mickey Mouse, and then go, and it looks like Donald Duck. Maybe something more reasonable than that, but that's the idea. So the idea here is to have a reconfigurable hologram based on nanotubes and liquid crystals. And it uses the same idea as the field emission, except in reverse. You have a, a nanotube in a liquid crystal cell. You apply a bias, and the fields will focus like that. And that changes the liquid crystal director. It will focus into that. And that means that this thing then acts to effectively give you a liquid crystal with a graded refractive index, which makes it look like a, a lens, exactly the same as an optical lens. And so it's a reconfigurable micro-optical lens. And so by putting a bunch of these nanotubes in the bottom of a liquid crystal, you can get an array of lenses. It doesn't look like a lens there, but it will in a minute. Forget all that. So now what we're doing is looking at a bunch of these nanotubes, and we're just focusing in and focusing out as we pulse these liquid crystals. Now this, as it stands, isn't mud good because every one of these liquid crystals is connected to the substrate and so you're always going to have that same shape. But if you could actually grow these liquid crystals such that you get lines of them or that you have a back plane where each individual transistor has a little CNT on them, then you can see that you can switch them and you can change the pattern of the back plane and that would change the hologram. So you've got a reconfigurable hologram just by changing the bias on these liquid crystals. Now we're getting towards there. Here's an example here of a CNT hologram, which I'm sure looks like nothing, but when you shine a laser on it, it looks like these little pretty pictures. Here's another one which looks even worse, but that in fact, when you shine green light through it, is Cambridge. So you can actually configure these things in certain ways. The idea, the next thing now, is to actually have each one of these individually addressed so the next time we do it, it can say Oxford or maybe Waterloo perhaps. <laughs> but it's, it's another potentially interesting application for uh, CNTs. My feeling is that CNTs are never going to replace silicon. It just isn't going to happen. But I think they will complement silicon. So I mean, you can use them for the interconnection and, and for hats for um, heat sinking. You can use them to reinforce the solder and high-power devices, a bit like reinforced concrete, where you put metal bars to reinforce concrete, you can put nanotubes through the um, solder. I mentioned before the interconnects and the vias, that's definitely going to come on board sometime. And sensors, you can actually integrate CNTs with CMOS to make, make sensors. So I think it complements silicon rather than replaces silicon. So that's my conclusions. Easy to grow single wall and multi wall. Near term applications, I think, are still dominated by field emission. Longer term, lots and lots of them. It's very 
important to control the chirality and position before you can actually start working with logic and all the rest of it. Direct integration of CNTs with silicon, they will complement silicon. And I think that's the best way forward. Several applications. But other nanowires, nanorods, silicon, zinc oxide are all coming up on board. They may take over. And of course, graphene is the next miracle material. So we could be doing the same thing for graphene in 15 years' time. But one never knows. Thank you. And I'm sorry about the glitch. Well, that was excellent. Uh, any questions? Uh, yeah. Can you address this uh, you know, thermal interface by using carbon nanotech? Can you? The thermal interface. Yep. So, Balikants, that's um, one of the main, for some companies, it seems to be one of the main ways forward that uh, because you've got this, if you have a copper heat sink, you always get little gaps between the copper heat sink and the thing you're trying to cool down. So if you can actually get, it may be graphene, may be the good, a good application for this as well, but if you can move carbon nanotubes before, in between them, they're much more pliable. And that might be a good application for graphene as well. Just filling in the hole. Yeah? Uh, what about durability? Do they, like you had a switch where they... Durability, yeah. That, that was done for a few thousand times. That was okay. It, I mean, you can blow them up very easily. For the field emission, for instance, if you dry them too hard, you just blow them up. This is a capacitive effect. So there's lots of interesting work being done on, on hydrophobicity of carbon nanotubes as well. But once again, the problem is if you do that to them, they, <laughs> they disintegrate. So you have to be very careful. Yeah. Uh, it was quite interesting. Uh, you showed that you can use uh, carbon nanotubes to produce X-rays. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, how much uh, field uh, do you have to uh, apply in order to produce? Yeah, it, it, it's, this, it's the same sort of field as you need normally, except because the CNTs have got the point on them, you can actually reduce the, the, the local, you can, the, the local field is, is, is much lower. Now, exactly what it is, I don't know, because I don't make the devices. I give them to the, the company that do them. But it's not the three kilovolts. No, 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 it's, no, it's not. No, it has it's to be, it, it's portable. This is the point. The biggest problem is maintaining the vacuum. Because yeah. these things are stable at 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 7. When you get to 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 5, they tend to degrade quite quickly. So you, you, you have problems doing that. Yeah. Yeah. This is an economics question, but w w do you have any idea what the, uh, the, uh, the market uh, revenues for carbon nanotubes are at the moment? No, I don't know. I mean, People, there are people who make money selling them yeah, um, right. from yeah, exactly. Rice and Company. No, I don't know. Oh, they have to. No, I don't know. No, I don't know. No. Okay, no further questions. Uh, I'll ask you to join me in thanking uh, Professor Milne for a very clearly presented and fascinating talk on carbon